All right, welcome everybody. My name is Brent Garbin. I am the Senior Product Manager for Imaging for Plan Mecca, and we welcome you to today's Dental Sleep Medicine Team on Fire program uh, with Michael Cohen. Uh, before we get started uh, with uh, uh, Mr. Cohen, we are going to go over just a little bit about how this will all work today if this is new for you. Um, thank you for joining us for the first time. Um, so how things work is we basically um, have an, an hour lecture with, uh, with uh, Michael Cohen. And throughout the lecture, you're free and open, invited to ask as many questions as you want. Um, so at the bottom of your screen, you'll notice you have a chat section. So go ahead and hit chat and um, you can chat there for technical things. And then there's a Q&A tab that you can can click on and there's where you can ask any question for uh, Michael. So once again, we'll use chat for more of the technical issues if you're having any uh, audio issues or anything like that that we can address, but we'll reserve the Q&A portion um, for all the questions that you have throughout the lecture. Um, as far as other webinars, if you are looking for more of these types of um, engagements with Plan Mecca, if you go to our website, which is planmecca.com, P-L-A-N, meca.com you will see under our training section there is a uh, spot where we have uh, plenty of webinars that are conducted um, that are free of charge for our uh, dental community and we actually have one this evening which is at 6 p.m central it's by a hygienist uh, joy void homes she's going to be talking about smart scaling techniques exploring new evidence-based treatments so if you have the ability tonight and you're free at 6 p.m central join us for that webinar and then next friday at 12 central time at noon dr wally renee from the medical university of south carolina will be joining us for the topic of digital smile design is the perfect combination of mathematics and art. And if you're not familiar with digital smile design, um, it allows you to do um, some uh, pre-surgery uh, uh, photos and mock-ups, cosmetic imaging um, capabilities, and then you can tie that even to your CAD CAM uh, restorative designs as well for chair-side milling. So please join us next Friday at 12 noon for Dr. Wally Renee uh, for that uh, webinar. So as far as today, um, we're going to be turning it over to uh, Michael Cohen here, and um, this is a one-hour CE. At the conclusion of the event, uh, we'll answer any outstanding questions that are left over, and then under the chat section, I will post a link for your CE. So please stay tuned for the conclusion, and we'll post a CE uh, link for you to uh, get your link. And then if you want to see this um, webinar uh, in its recording at the end, uh, we usually post that probably on Monday. So please visit um, us uh, next uh, uh, week and see the recording if you uh, have any friends uh, that have missed this. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Michael Cohen and we'll see you at the end here. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Brent. So uh, welcome everyone. Um, I see we have quite a few uh, joining us today. So I, uh, I wanna start off by just uh, thanking you for your time. And I hope we have a lot of fun for the next 50 or so minutes. Um, like uh, Brent said, uh, Plan Mecca was kind enough to sponsor this event. Um, we are gonna talk about today, your team being on fire as it relates to dental sleep medicine. Uh, if you have started a program and you think that's impossible, I wanna start off by saying, I encourage you to keep plugging away because it matters. And there is a much easier way than you've probably been dealing with uh, if you're dealing with some team issues and stuff like that. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about a lot of that stuff. If you guys are just looking at starting your program, you're gonna be able to glean some information today that will help you start off on the right foot, specifically with your team. Uh, we're going to talk a lot today about dental sleep medicine being a team sport. So a lot of the components that I'm going to share with you, whether they're clinical or operational, they're going to be through the vein of how to communicate that with your team or through your team to patients. Um, so a couple of things, uh, as Brent mentioned, uh, Plan Mecca has been kind enough to host this webinar uh, for disclosures from a CE standpoint. I just need to tell you that they have paid me for my time today. Uh, so I thank them and you guys for joining us. Uh, also, I am the CEO founder of Awaken to Sleep. So we are a for-profit company that coaches and trains dentists on this topic. So those are my disclosures. Um, 
beyond that, uh, I'm excited to get into why we are doing this. So my first question to you is, if you haven't already answered this, you've got to be able to answer why are you here today, but more importantly, when you're talking to patients or implementing a program, why do you want to do that? Are you doing sleep because the crown and bridge business is slow? Probably not right now due to COVID. There's a lot of stress. There's a lot of things going on. Um, a lot of people coming back in now that offices are open, but are you doing sleep just because of a personal reason? Well, that matters. You know, what if you're, I don't know if your dad had sleep apnea and there was a family component there that you grew up thinking it was normal and, and your dad is your story. We have clients like that. For me, it was my mom uh, and my daughter. And I'll share with you a little bit more about that here in a minute. But just to pause here, we definitely need to make sure that we understand why we are doing what we're doing and also make sure that that aligns with who we are. You as a doctor, you as a dental professional, have who you are and what you do. But those two things have to match, they have to be aligned. So when you're understanding your why, your purpose, and you can clearly communicate that to patients, as you're gonna to see today, it's gonna to give you a long runway with them to start talking about things that they may have not walked into your practice thinking about, i.e. obstructive sleep apnea or airway issues. So as I mentioned, I wanna share with you a little bit about my family. So this is my beautiful family, my wife Hannah and my four kiddos. The one I wanna tell you about is Anna. She's the one in the upper right-hand corner. Anna uh, is our second kiddo. Uh, she is currently 12 and feels like she's 21 sometimes. But Anna was born uh, with acid reflux. So when we brought Anna home from the hospital, we knew that she was healthy but not quite okay. And her constant crying day in and day out, day in and day out was unnerving. Uh, you could say our life was on fire. Um, we had two dates in five months. Each set of parents watched her once and then swore that they loved us, but they could never do that again. Because it's pretty unreal when you have a child that you know something's wrong and they keep crying to tell you that and you can't fix it. So long story short, we were in and out of the doctor's office several times for over the course of five months. Anna had a recurring ear infection. She had 13 rounds of antibiotics that didn't take it away, both ears and her left eardrum perforated twice before she was five months old. She was constantly crying because of the pain from the reflux, spitting up across the room, and then the meds that they gave her added colic <laughs> to our cocktail of issues that she dealt with. But what we didn't know is that underneath all of that, Anna was dealing with obstructive sleep apnea. And we found that out because I walked into her room on a Saturday, because I heard something I hadn't heard in a very long time, and it was silence. In my house, Anna was always crying, so there was always noise. And when I went into her room and looked in her crib, I watched her do this. <laughs> and as she gasped for air, I looked at her fingertips, and they were blue, her lips were blue, and I freaked out. And I picked her up, and I held her, and she was crying, and then she started breathing. And as I calmed her in my arms, she did the same thing again. Now, you guys, I was trained 17 years ago as a pediatric sleep technician at a leading children's hospital in Southern California. So at that time, that was five years after that training, I was a sleep tech. I knew clinically what this looked like, but it, I didn't click that she was dealing with this until I physically saw her gasp for air. And when I saw that, I immediately knew she was dealing with obstructive sleep apnea, even as an infant, because I myself had tested kids her age in a hospital setting years before that. So knowing that, having that training and seeing what I did, we did everything within our power. The local hospital was gonna take four and a half months to get her in. So I called in every favor I had and I helped an adult sleep technician do their first ever pediatric sleep test on an infant 
in a private sleep center. And a week later, we had results walking into that pediatrician's office with our daughter, my wife and I sitting there. I knew she had apnea. I watched it happen, but I can't look at her and know how bad it is. I can't see her blue lips and fingertips and know how bad her oxygen was. I just know it's bad. And I, guys, I will never forget him looking at us, Dr. Roy Smith, God bless him. He looked at my wife and I and he said, it's because you guys knew about apnea that your daughter is here today. She has severe obstructive sleep apnea and her oxygen drops into the low 80s when she has these apneic events. Thank you for pushing and getting her seen quickly. Here's what we're gonna do. And he just started off with the regimen of meds that were gonna control her reflux, which in infants causes sleep apnea because the airway collapses to protect the nasopharynx from actually having the acid erosion come up when the babies have reflux. But if that collapse happens at the same time they're breathing in, it can cause apnea. The only reason my daughter is here today is because of the knowledge that someone else invested in me as a sleep tech five years before that moment, and it impacted our family's life in this way. If this family picture only had three kids instead of four, I couldn't tell you that story today, 11 years later. But our story is happy and it's joyful. And that sweet little girl is here because people taught me and then we were able to help her. So if there is something that I know that I can give to you, that is the passion that I personally have and our company has in sharing about the awareness about this disease that we'll talk about is so underdiagnosed. So that's who I am. That was quite a story, but I, I share that with you so you know who's talking to you and, and really honestly why this matters to me. Because if you don't understand my why, you may not understand what I'm doing or how I'm doing it, what I'm saying or why I'm saying it that way. But if you can understand the passion and the thing that's making me tick, just like the way that your patients and your team need to understand what's making you tick, it's gonna make a lot of sense for everybody else moving forward. So pardon me if I get a little rowdy on our webinar today. Uh, I promise to keep us on track and hopefully keep us uh, completely on time. I will do my best. So as we hop into sleep apnea, it's important uh, that we understand a few key definitions. Now, I promise to not give you guys a ton of slides that only have text, but we got to get a couple of things out of the way. First off, most importantly, when I say the word apnea or sleep apnea, specifically in this context, I'm only dealing with obstructive sleep apnea. You see, obstructive sleep apnea is the type where you have a physical obstruction in the airway that causes the cessation of breath or the breathing disorder while someone is sleeping. If you have central sleep apnea, on the other hand, that's a central nervous system type of disorder that is completely outside of your scope as a dentist. So when I say the words apnea or sleep apnea, we are only talking about obstructive sleep apnea, which is in your scope. All right, so what is the definition of apnea? It's a reduction in airflow of at least 90% for a minimum 10 seconds. So basically, a complete cessation of breath for a minimum 10 seconds. A hypopnea, apnea's smaller cousin, if you will, is a partial apnea. So that's a 30% reduction in airflow, followed by a 4% oxygen drop. Now, percent, percent. Airflow is the air we get in and out of our airway and into our lungs. Percent of oxygen saturation is the finger probe on your, uh, or the probe on your fingertip that glows red and measures your peripheral oxygen saturation. So 30% reduced airflow here, 4% reduction in oxygen here. So how you're breathing is directly impacting your overall oxygenation in your body. And that's what we're looking at. Okay, again, that event has to last at least 10 seconds. If you put those two events together, all of the events throughout the night of testing, and then divide it by the number of hours that the patient slept, you get your magic number, which is the AHI, apnea hypopnea index. Uh, key note, anytime you see the word index in a medical diagnostic report, it typically means per hour. 
So any index that you look at in a sleep study, it's giving you a numeric value for something that occurred per hour in the test. The other thing, a respiratory disturbance index, your RDI, that's your AHI plus the number of respiratory effort related arousals. In layman's terms, that's how many times you have snoring events that lead to waking up throughout the night. So in normal breathing, we want to breathe in and out strictly through our nose. Now that's an important note because many people can't breathe nasally. So they default to breathing orally. That has a whole host of health impacts, especially in children when you're trying to have face forward craniofacial development. But even in adults, it can cause issues. If we're looking at it from an airway or an apnea standpoint, breathing through your nose allows for cleaning of the air, moistening of the air, and allows for proper tongue position. That's the key note here, proper tongue position while someone is breathing. If we have snoring occurring, we can have the soft palate flop back in the back of our airway and snore nasally. Now that sounds completely different than oral snoring. I'll give you an example. In through the nose, soft palate is vibrating, making the noise. Now with snoring, if you're breathing through your nose like you should be, and your soft palate flops back and it makes that sound, you will only ever breathe through your nose as long as you can get enough oxygen and airflow. The second that you can't, you open up your mouth. If you don't believe me, find someone who loves you that won't kill you and pinch their nose and see what the first thing is that they do. I guarantee you the first thing they do is open their mouth to breathe. The second thing they do is probably start swinging at you. So be careful with that. Like I said, do it to somebody you love that's not gonna kill you. But that's the natural response of our body. We always want to maintain oxygen and carbon dioxide balance. We will do so automatically without thinking about it every chance we get. So if the nose doesn't work, we default to the mouth. This is also very important when you start testing patients and they come back from a sleep center or your home sleep test that you're doing, very important because they will say things like, oh, I have a deviated septum, or I have allergies, or I had a head cold and it really affected my sleep study. Uh, you can't fake apnea. You can't fake your breathing disorder that makes your oxygen drop throughout your whole body. So just be aware, if there's a nasal obstruction, we will open our mouth. Now the problem with apnea occurs when the obstruction happens below our oral pharynx or in the back of it at the bottom. So when we look at the tongue falling back in this particular diagram, you can see that both the nasal and oral cavity are obstructed. This is when obstructive sleep apnea happens, not just through the nose, but through the mouth also. So if you hear a patient snoring like this, that sounds completely different than the nasal snoring I just shared with you. So when the collapse happens in the back of the oropharynx and the tongue is falling back and it's collapsing against that soft tissue, vibrating just like what I did right now for you, that's making the snoring sound. A reduction in 30% of that airflow and 4% oxygen is a hypopnea. A complete collapse like this, that's obstructive sleep apnea. So that's what we're looking at in patients and that's what we have to be careful for. So if we wanna look at Bernoulli's principle here, uh, this is a principle of aero and fluid dynamics. I wanna explain the collapse that I just talked to you about. Why would we be able to breathe through our nose or our mouth and then all of a sudden this tissue collapses? What's going on there? Well, this principle applies in this particular circumstance, just like it does with an In-N-Out shake. Like I mentioned, I'm from Southern California. Uh, that's where In-N-Out started. If you guys haven't had it, uh, this is uh, California's fast food cult, and we love it. So if you come here, uh, please enjoy an In-N-Out shake. This is a Neapolitan shake, and get your burger animal style. You won't regret it. Back to our topic. Uh, Bernoulli's principle, this law of aerodynamics. If you take an in and out shake, which is real ice cream when you get it in the cup, or any real ice cream shake, the first thing that you wanna do is suck on the straw and get your shake. 
but it's not a shake yet. It's still ice cream. So when that happens, you suck harder because you haven't gotten anything out and the straw whoop, collapses. Now we have two options, only two, to open up this straw. We can A, stop sucking, which at this point would be a novel concept. Or two, we can use our fingers to pinch the opposite ends of the straw that haven't collapsed and open that straw back up. Two time, two things. Now in an airway setting, let's translate this example. In the shake, you have an obstruction on the bottom and you have the mouth pulling air through this closed environment, AKA causing a vacuum and a collapse. That's Bernoulli's principle in layman's terms. If you flip that shake upside down, we have an airway collapse here at the base of our throat. And then we have our lungs and our diaphragm pulling air in to our lungs. So if we're trying to breathe in and out, in and out, and we have this obstruction, what are we doing to the airway? We're collapsing it. We're creating a vacuum inside that's dropping it down and collapsing it. So the only way to open that airway is to either stop breathing, which if we need oxygen or we're blowing off carbon dioxide, that's a bad idea because we're dead. So we don't wanna do that. The second option is to use the muscle tone in our throat to open up the airway, reposition the tongue, and then start breathing again. The only problem with that scenario of waking, of doing the muscle tone is that we have to wake up because our muscles, our skeletal muscles in our throat are asleep when we are. So in order to not die from choking in an apneic event, our body has to wake up even for a brief moment out of its sleep state, use muscles to open up the airway, and then go from there. So as I share this with you, again, through the vein of helping your team understand what patients are dealing with and helping them communicate to those patients, this is a great example. If you guys have straws in the office, I know they're outlawed in some states, I'm in California, but um, if you have straws, you put your finger on the end of the straw and have them suck on the other end of the straw and watch it collapse. And then show them, hey, this is what you have to do. You have to let go of that suction, AKA stop breathing, or you can use your fingers and pinch it. That's what's happening with apnea. So great example, chair side if you want to with straws or just communicating it verbally. Um, it's easy to understand that way. Couple other exercises I wanna do with you. Uh, and don't kill me. Um, I will give the disclaimer, if you are pregnant or you have a lung condition or anything where you don't feel comfortable, please do not feel like you have to participate. That being said, I wanna do two things with you. Uh, the first thing is if you will go with me on this, I'd like for you to take, to breathe with me. So in and out through your nose if you can, if not, through your mouth is fine. You take a deep breath in and out and in and out. Blow it all out, all out, and then stop. And I'm gonna count as we hold our breath. So keep holding it, don't breathe. If you're able to, keep going. We're at 10 seconds. 15 seconds. 20. 25, 30, okay, brief. If you were able to hold it that long, uh, that 30 seconds probably felt like an eternity. Uh, you're probably noticing that your heart is beating a little bit faster. That is cortisol being reduced as the stress hormone in your body. Uh, we'll get to more of that later, but uh, the stress hormone is released because what you just did is created a slight bit of oxidative stress. So low oxygen level buildup of CO2, that's what you just created in the body. So when you have oxidative stress, your body will immediately re release adrenaline and cortisol into your system. So that way your heart starts beating faster, your sympathetic nervous system responds. Uh, the other thing, if you were able to hold it for the 30 seconds, the other thing that you'll notice is that you were not thinking about anything peripheral. What you just did is change where you're thinking in your brain. Instead of being logical 
and understanding perception and all rational thinking in the prefrontal cortex, you actually move to the basal brain in the amygdala, which is your fight or flight survival mode. So anytime we have oxidative stress, we move where we're thinking in the brain to a survival mode and we increase cortisol in our system. Bad news for anybody who's doing this on a regular basis. Now, the reason why I had you breathe out and pause at the end of your exhale, that's at a point in the respiratory pattern called P critical. That's where most all apnea occurs. So the reason why 10 seconds as a sleep apnea event is defined, the reason why 10 seconds is so important is it's at the end of an exhale and there's no pool of oxygen left in the lungs. I mean, many swimmers that train can go minutes with holding their breath because they take a deep breath and then they know how to hold it or use it as they're swimming underwater. But if we exhale all of that pool of oxygen in our lungs and we have no reserves, that 10 seconds starts to create a massive problem for us. We gotta be careful of that. All right, last exercise and then we're gonna move on here. Um, if you go to an ENT and have an airway exam, they do a lot of questionnaires, they do an a nasal and intraoral exam. They do a fantastic job. It's super comprehensive. If you have obstruction, one of the things they will do prior to actually operating on you is they want to find the point of collapse. So they will do a nasopharyngoscopy. That's a camera. They spray numbing material. It goes in your nose and down the back of your throat, and they will have you simulate apnea to find the point of collapse in your airway. <clears throat> As an ENT, this is super important because they need to know where to cut. They don't wanna cut the wrong area. If in your airway, one area is collapsing over another, they have to know that. So it's a fantastic test. It's a little uncomfortable, but it's okay. I'm gonna do a modified uh, exam with you. So what I want you to do is I want you to pinch your nose. You're gonna close your mouth and try to take four deep breaths in and out, as deep as you can. You won't get any air, I understand, but just go with me on this. So pinch your nose, close your mouth, and do this. Whew, all right. I don't know about you guys, but I have two headphones in and my ears just popped uh, because of the negative pressure in the airway. But um, if you did that right, some of you likely felt a collapse right here. That is your oropharynx, one of the weakest parts of the airway, starting to collapse with that vacuum. Because what we just did is we created the collapse. We pinched our nose, closed our mouth, no air getting in or out, and then we told our diaphragm to work and pull air into the lungs. So we're creating that Bernoulli's principle vacuum in the airway. If you did it and you took deep breaths like that in that example, and you felt pressure right here in just below your sternum, that's your upper esophageal sphincter having pressure, intrathoracic pressure from the diaphragm. So the diaphragm is working hard to pull air into the lungs, and it's pushing on that sphincter. Translation. That's the valve that opens and closes when you swallow food and it keeps the stomach acid in the stomach. The latest studies show that 26% of patients with acid reflux have reflux that's secondary to obstructive sleep apnea, meaning that constant pressure on that valve is causing them to have reflux throughout the night. It's not an overproduction of acid. So in infants, like my daughter's story, reflux can cause apnea, but in adults, it's the reverse. Apnea can actually cause the reflux. So just a couple of key facts and some exercises. I hope I didn't kill anybody, uh, for lack of a better term, but let's keep going here. Um, with the definitions, we've got to know severity levels. So simply put, based on the AHI, apnea hypopnea index, the AASM, American Academy of Sleep Medicine standards, are you are normal if you do this less than five times an hour. You may not feel normal, but that's what normal is defined as. So uh, mild is five to 15 events per hour, moderate is 15 to 30, and 30 and above is severe. 30 and above, just to put this in context, guys, this is a per hour number. So it 30 times is once every two minutes, 
the patient stops breathing for at least 10 seconds, often at this severity, much longer, but at least 10 seconds. And then in order to regain their breathing and respiratory pattern, they have to wake up out of sleep to use these muscles and open up the airway to then start breathing again. That sounds pretty crazy. And if they're constantly doing this over and over and over, it's amazing that our bodies are designed to cope with this type of a problem and still survive. This is our survival mechanism kicking in place. But if you look at these numbers, now it's easy to understand why someone who wakes up 10 times an hour, 15 times an hour, and they're mild or moderate, and you wonder like, holy cow, why is this person so tired? How can they fall asleep in my dental chair when I have all this extra PPE on and all of this stuff going on? This is why. They're so chronically sleep deprived because their body is prioritizing oxygen over sleep. And then vice versa, when the apnea gets longer, they're dealing with this so much, they just can't, they're in a survival state. And so they don't have that extra energy because they've been waking up all night long. That's where chronic fatigue comes from. Now the low oxygen rate is gonna cause a lot of other health impacts. As we can see from this study here, we can see all of these different diseases, most of which are cardiac. So some of the top ones that I would reference, all hypertension. Think about your dental practice today. How many patients either on hypertensive meds or have said yes to hypertension on your health history? Sometimes that's different. Um, how many of those patients do you have? Over a third of them have apnea, statistically speaking. That's a ton of people. You look at type 2 diabetes at 72%. Obesity is 77, and drug-resistant hypertension, where multiple meds are used to treat the hypertension, 83%. That's a lot of people. From what we have seen as a national coaching company and the folks that we've worked with, depending on the region that you're in, there's anywhere from 26 to 38% of your population that's suffering from a sleep disorder, and the vast majority don't know it. On this slide, this is a study that was done in 2012. 90% of people in 2012 had no idea that they were apneic in America. 90%. I believe that number has dropped in the recent studies to 85%, but guys, frankly, that's pathetic. In one of the most developed countries, healthcare-wise and all of the systems that we have, this is a chronic condition that is absolutely causing major health impacts on people, if not causing death in certain circumstances, we've got to do this better. We've got to find this more proactively. And that's why most of our conversation is going to revolve around awareness and screening. So this is a big deal. Um, some other studies just to share with you, uh, looking at a macro scale of the United States, the one on the left is the sleepiness of the different states. So you can find your state, the darker the color, the higher percentage. The same thing is uh, in the study on the right, that's heart disease death rates. Darker the color, higher number of cases. We can directly see a correlation with where sleepiness or sleeplessness is absolutely correlated, not causing, but correlated to heart disease death rates. The same thing goes for stroke and the same thing for diabetes. Now, I understand that Food and diet and obesity and all of these things play a role in all of these factors right here in these studies. But we absolutely cannot minimize the impact of healthy sleep on our body. These studies show a correlation. The last slide that I showed you showed 80 or 77% of patients with obesity also have obstructive sleep apnea. Now, one can be causing the other or vice versa and it's different for different patients. But just know, it's not just weight that is causing these issues, it's how we're sleeping. And oftentimes, as I mentioned, when people have apnea and they're releasing cortisol in their body, that stress hormone makes our body store food as fat because it's telling us we are in a crisis. We also start craving simple carbs like ice cream and sugar. So releasing that, every night when our body is supposed to be resting is a really bad idea. And that's gonna have a huge impact.
as people go throughout their life. So how we sleep absolutely matters to our overall health. Uh, if you look at this slide, uh, this is one that we created a while ago, and it's just, again, a helpful tool for your team to be able to communicate with patients simply. Hey, it's, it might be on the wall. It might be on a ceiling tile when you lay people back and it's something they can look at, however you want to use it. But the key point here is we're trying to get big clinical things, studies and correlations and things that you would understand clinically as a health professional. And we've got to simplify that down in a way that patients understand. So if you have something like this out in the office, this would be what we would call a touch point in the communication process. It doesn't necessarily have to be a conversation where you pull it out and talk about it, but it's something that they see as they're in your office and it's a touch point mentally on this topic of airway and sleep apnea. The social impact, even though it's not health related, is still very, very important to people. Uh, sound is measured in decibels. Here are some examples, jet engine being all the way up to 118. The loudest recorded snore on file to date is a lady named Jenny Campbell in the United Kingdom, and her snoring is at 111 decibels. I don't know how her husband is alive, but when you snore, it matters. It matters to your health. It also matters to your bed partner, for sure. Uh, taser therapy is not recommended, so please don't use that for airway. It will definitely wake them up, but your life might be in danger as well. Uh, the other part, 25% of couples sleep apart. Most of that is due to airway. Why do I say that? The number one bed partner complaint, head and shoulders above everything else, is snoring at 44%. So the number one complaint in why couples sleep apart is snoring, and that is fixable. And it's also something that's right within your scope. Uh, number one requested feature on new home builds in several states is two master bedrooms. My only point here is please note where the master bedrooms are as far apart as they can be. <laughs> uh, so I would just pause here. If you guys are taking notes, writing things down, I would just kind of take stock. When we understand what's at stake here and we start looking at patients, one of the things that I would encourage you to do personally, as well as professionally as a team, talk about who you know. Based on this minimal information so far, this is just a, a glimpse, if you will, but just on this information, the studies, the symptoms and complications, whatever, you're thinking of a few people right now. Write down their names. So if you are thinking of a mom or a dad or a brother or a cousin or whoever, please write them down. Talk to them. If it's a friend, maybe it's a patient. When you do this in context with your team, help them understand you're going to look at two buckets of people their home team, just like I shared with you, your home team, your family, your friends, your people, they're going to have their own home team. And then we want to look at the work home team. Who are our patients? Who's on the staff that's concerned they might have this? Write the list down because we think we know and then we will forget. Life is busy. Stuff is crazy right now. Please write it down. Have that conversation with people as you need it. Ali, um, I got your question here. I will try to balance the question and answer with the slides. Uh, is snoring always correlated with OSA? Fantastic question. Um, snoring is not always an indicator of apnea, meaning you can snore and not have apnea. But the only way to know that you don't have apnea is by testing. So you have to have an objective test that's performed at night while you're sleeping to rule out obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, let me share it to you this way. If your airway is supposed to be like this, and this is snoring, and this is apnea, the difference between snoring and apnea is much closer than an open airway and snoring. So anytime you have a collapse where the tissue is vibrating and causing a sound for snoring, that's a definite indicator that you want to get the person ruled out for obstructive sleep apnea. Great question. Okay, so as we move on, I want to talk about the dance. 
you as a dental professional, I'm talking to dentists right now, uh, you as a dentist or a doctor of dental medicine cannot diagnose obstructive sleep apnea. It's a medical condition. So my point in saying that is we have to have a collaborative multidisciplinary team to treat this disease. Key fact, you cannot go rogue, screen people, treat them and move on. That's absolutely not allowed. This is a potentially life-threatening condition. Please follow the protocol. This process here is again, a glimpse of a much deeper dive protocol, but these three easy steps are very simple to follow. The first part we've already been talking about, identify is the screening phase. And we're gonna get a little bit more into that here in a second. The next part is assessment, where we're gonna test patients. And the third part is treatment. The testing can be done in multiple different varieties, and I'm gonna share that with you today. But make sure you understand the role of your team and an external physician who's gonna be diagnosing this. So let's talk about the team here for a quick minute. Uh, one of the things that you guys have probably seen are multiple sleep questionnaires that are out there. Uh, this is one that we frequently use. I love this one because it's objective. It has a numeric score that's weighted based on the different questions. Now this test, if they get yeah, on this questionnaire, pardon me, if they answer the questions here and they get a score of eight or higher, they should have a test. So this is strictly a uh, do you need a sleep test type of questionnaire. So if you guys wanna take a picture of this and tally your score up, that would be fantastic. Um, I normally would pause here and then have you do that, but I'm gonna keep going because I wanna uh, get us out of here on time today. So take a picture, do the test uh, on your own after the fact, or at the end, if you wanna pop your score in, you're welcome to do that. Uh, questionnaire is not the end all be all. Guys, people connect to people, not paper. So when your patients walk in and your hygienist is talking to them, they love him or her and they likely have a relationship. If you are handing them a bunch of paper, do they like you? Not usually. I mean, I'll do respect. They still like you. They're in your practice for a reason. But no one likes paper. You don't, I don't, your patients don't. They will absolutely connect better to your people than they will to that paper. So make sure that questionnaires have their place. Health history forms, whatnot, on an iPad, whatever you do. But if you have the opportunity to ask the patient questions in your exam, do that. If you don't, have them fill out a questionnaire, but then talk to them about it. That talking is the crucial part. In an intraoral exam, there's a lot of things we're gonna look for. Uh, first thing is any intraoral crowding, so soft tissue crowding, a long uvula, increased uh, tonsil size, or a large tongue, all things that we're gonna look for. On a Malampati score, this is, uh, Dr. Malampati was a Harvard uh, anesthesiologist. He actually came up with this classification to see if patients were prone to airway collapse post extubation for a surgery. Very important because once you pull that tube out, the patient has to maintain their own airway, even with all of the meds and painkillers in their system. So this score is very easy to find. The thing that you do is have your patient sit up in the dental chair or sitting upright anywhere. They have to be upright and they open their mouth and they stick out their tongue. They do not say ah. If you stick out your tongue and say ah, it postures the soft palate up. We do not want that. So open your mouth, stick out your tongue. Class one, you can see airway on both sides of the uvula and underneath. In class two, you can clearly see it on both sides, but not underneath of the uvula anymore. Class three, you barely see the airway peeking through. Class four, you think you're looking at the airway, but it's just the curtain soft palate. So when you're looking at this score, this is very simple to do. Once you get used to it, you literally will ask the patient, okay, go ahead and open your mouth and stick out your tongue as far as you can. Okay, thanks. And you document what classification they are. If you wanna go above and beyond and you have the time, ask them if they want a picture, if they want a picture of what you're looking at and use their phone. So that way you can show them what you're looking at and maybe they'll post it on social media later. There's different intricacies in how you do that in a hygiene visit, depending on the time, the relationship, the PPE, all of that stuff. So I don't wanna get stuck in the weeds there, 
but this is a very easy classification and it's created by an anesthesiologist and this is something that they use in every single surgery that happens in a hospital as standard protocol. Next, here's the list of things we're gonna look for. I like pictures better. Um, sorry. So macroglossia and acid reflux, we've already talked about large tongue and the reflux component. Um, bruxism is a huge one. Uh, if you guys are doing night guards in the office, please start screening those folks for airway issues. You never know if airway is causing their bruxism or if the bruxism is primary until you test for it. Just like Ali's question about snoring, is snoring always correlated to OSA? Not necessarily, but the only way you know is if you test for it. The same with bruxism. If you're gonna do a night guard, make sure you get that patient screened for sleep apnea and possibly tested to rule out obstructive sleep apnea as the cause of that stress. We know that bruxism is stress-induced. You don't know what kind. If it's psychosomatic stress because their life is stressful, that's one thing. But if they're incurring oxidative stress because their airway is collapsing, that's a totally different type of stress. And you could possibly treat both the bruxism and the apnea with the same appliance. So know what you're looking for. Uh, tongue scalloping, attrition, um, high vaulted or narrow high arching hard palate is another one. And the list goes on. So again, if you guys want to take a picture or watch this uh, video later that Plan Mecca posts, that'd be great. But these are things that I would add to your intraoral exam paperwork for your hygienist. Things that they're going to look for. And as you start checking those boxes, you're going to naturally, with things you already see, start having these conversations with patients about their airway health. It's a key thing you want to do. Uh, the other thing that we really want to make sure, um, and again, Plymec as a technology company is, offers amazing solutions for this. We want to look at how do we communicate this effectively with patients. Now, I will tell you guys, words matter and how your team communicates matters. But there is something about patients seeing a picture that is, gives them a different perspective and that speaks a thousand words. I mean, that's, that's the thing that we hear all the time. A picture is worth a thousand words. I can tell you, if we show a patient this airway diagram, and specifically, I'm going to move my mouse over here, uh, this airway, and if I believe this is my face, what do you think I'm thinking right now? Let's just say I believe this is me because you just took this picture and my face popped up on your screen. What's my eye naturally go to? That little dot right there, is that normal? Because that doesn't look good. It's color-coded red, which tells me, caution, there's a, a problem here. And then as it narrows, you guys, one key fact here was screening with a cone beam. You're not diagnosing, you're screening. Everybody understands that. But let me be clear, this is the best airway anyone is ever going to have. They are standing up, upright, with muscle tone and awake in your office. Do you think their airway collapses when they lose that muscle tone and lay down on their back or their side and fall asleep at night? Absolutely. So this picture is the best airway they're ever gonna have. If this is concerning, we should be concerned that they also have a sleep airway issue and that their airway is more compromised at night. Uh, Melinda, uh, why is bicuspid extraction a sign of OSA? Great question. Um, I'm going to shorten that big answer <laughs> into a very uh, short answer. Um, it's tongue space. If we decrease the arch size and pull the front teeth back with bicuspid extractions, oftentimes we don't get as wide of an arch. And what we're doing is we're trading straight teeth and adding space for those teeth to be straight and beautiful and we're trading off tongue space. So in a lot of cases, the tongue has to sit in a partially retruded spot. So if it ever grows, we get heavier, the tongue has partially, uh, is partially made of fat, any of those issues, or the airway becomes more collapsible with age or weight gain, um, it can be a problem. So as the tongue grows and it doesn't have the arch to grow in, that's why we, there's an issue there. Great question. All right, so as I shared with you guys, um, we got to get people tested. And this is a quintessential factor here. So 
there are a couple of options that we've got to talk through, but we've got to understand one key fact first. When you're going to give the patient an option for testing, you have to know what you're testing for, period. That's the first question. If you look at all of these disorders, there's over 90 diagnosable sleep disorders. Almost all of them are neurologic. A home sleep test is going to test for airway, obstructive sleep apnea, snoring, rule out central sleep apnea. Your in-lab sleep test is gonna test for everything else under the sun, and I'll show you why. These are the pictures. If you ask your patient right out of the gate, which one do they wanna do, everybody opts for the one on the left. But if that's the wrong test because you think they have a neurological condition that's outside of your scope, they might need the in-lab test. So make sure you answer that question first. What test do they need? And then move forward with asking them what tests they wanna go forward with. In a PSG uh, or in-lab polysomnogram, this is your process. Most patients will go to an in-lab sleep center, get hooked up like this gentleman and get a CPAP machine. And then they'll talk to their doctor. Here are all the channels. Uh, there's over 21 wires and leads hooked up to the person's body. They all go to a head box that looks like this. Now, the HST, home sleep test, uh, some people call it a real life alternative. Um, I would just say this is another alternative. It's easier. If patients will move forward with something, then we should do that, so long as it's the right clinical test for them. In many cases, when patients do a sleep test, they talk to a doctor first, especially if you're doing the test or referring them out, they come back to you and understand what their options are. And again, if a person has an option between an oral appliance or a CPAP, what are they gonna pick? You have to know if that's clinically appropriate based on the doctor's recommendation, but as a patient, I'm gonna always pick the, most, the least invasive option possible, and that's super important. Uh, the channels on a home sleep test can vary, but the main thing here that you've got to understand is there's less wires to hook up. Um, usually a cannula, a belt, and a pulse ox. The HST report, um, we don't have time to go through all the details, but the main thing I would show you here, the page on the left is an example interpretation. Make sure you always have a signed interpretation by a board certified sleep doctor before you begin treatment. Absolutely critical. Um, oral appliances vary in size and nature. They are almost all doing the exact same thing. You're protruding the mandible and creating a minimal vertical opening, i.e. more tongue space and a postured forward position in the tongue so that way you can get it out of the way. Uh, it works for almost all patients, but make sure that when you're doing this, you have the recommendation of that sleep physician, like I mentioned, on the sleep study, so that way you know you're moving forward with the right treatment. Um, one option to use after you start treating someone is Snore Lab. It is a cool app. It costs between three and five dollars, depending on the app store. Uh, you can record the entire night of sound and ask your patient in between your adjustment visits. Definitely have them do two nights of Snore Lab so that way you can get some objective information on how well they're doing. Again, snoring is not always apnea, like we said, but it's a direct correlation to what apnea looks like at night. And make sure you always, always do an efficacy or final follow-up sleep test. Uh, even if your patients are paying for it, again, it absolutely is critical. Make sure that doctor signs off on the fact that your oral appliance is working. Huge factor. All right, we're gonna wrap it up with money here. So let's talk about the money conversation. Um, we can't do everything for free, otherwise we would. Uh, but we've got bills to pay and we've got uh, people to take care of. So here's a list of the costs that come with doing an oral appliance in your practice. Um, we value your time at $700 in a calibrated workflow, i.e. your team is functioning, on all cylinders, they are trained and you're only doing what you as the doctor need to do. Your cost is about $950 plus or minus. So we call it just under a thousand. Uh, your average payment, these are cash values, not insurance values, is somewhere between $3,350 and $4,500. I valued it on the low side here. You guys can see that a $2,400 
net profit per patient. If you treated eight patients, this is one hygienist screening, testing, treating the funnel, right? You're not going to treat everybody that you screen. But if you just got to eight patients a month, which takes some work, don't get me wrong, um, the profits in that are substantial. So you don't have to get to this level to succeed. But even one of these cases per month is going to have a significant impact financially on the practice. So it doesn't take a lot to get a lot out of it. Um, we also would encourage you guys to get metrics. Um, track your numbers. Your hygienists are going to do things differently. They're going to have different conversations. Are they effective? Do they need coaching or training or are they great and they're good to go? Know how many people you're screening, know how many people you're moving forward in the process, know what that looks like. So that way, instead of going based on your gut and what you feel is going on, come back to here's what's actually happening. If you don't measure it, you can't manage it. If you don't measure it, you can't manage it. Make sure you get some screening metrics. Um, there's a lot of ways to do that. We're one of them. It doesn't matter. Move forward in your process as logically and rationally as you can. Equip the team, get the metrics, do some good work. Um, in this particular example, uh, the people that screened less actually made more, not because they were screening less, but because their close rate on cases was so high. The office that screened a ton of hundreds, literally hundreds of patients in this example, had a lower revenue for that particular month because they weren't converting. They had a lot of conversations that were completely unproductive and the patients never moved forward. That's a bad place to be. So again, when you're rolling your program out, make sure you know what you're measuring and measure it regularly and talk to the team openly about it. Because if you're a team and you're working towards this together, that's a crucial component. So wrapping it up, four things that you need to get into your team to get them on fire. Four core components. Number one, like I started off, get your corporate why down. Why are you doing this? Why does it matter to you? And how do you communicate that to patients? When you figure it out, can your office staff tell that to patients? Do they fumble or do they know? You've got to know because when you communicate why, your patients are going to give you a lot of leeway because they trust you because you've told them what matters to you. That's huge. The second thing is understanding what is going on with patients and why this matters to them. Why is talking about airway such a big deal? We hit a couple of high points in the impact that it has on their life, both health-wise and socially. How do you translate that to people and understanding their pain points? That's number two. Number three is sleep testing. What is your protocol? If you're just going about it willy-nilly, you're gonna completely forget that you referred people out. When they don't get tested, they're lost through the cracks. Don't do that. Keep a list, get a sleep test unit. There's a lot of options out there. Check with your state guidelines and make sure that you can own home sleep tests because in most states you can. Uh, there are a few that you can't. But decide on your testing protocol. Are you referring out? in lab sleep test, home sleep test, are you getting equipment in-house? And then have your team understand their roles around that. The last part is the revenue. You can't forget that because that's what funds the program. It may not be the first thing on your mind, but it's gotta be on the list. Does your team understand that this is revenue production for the practice? This is a non-aerosol generating procedure. It's higher revenue per head, and there are a stinking ton of people in your practice that have this disorder and they just don't know it. So all of those boxes are checked and the team can help you with this significantly. So do they understand the impact on the practice and how much this can help? Those four things, guys, if you can get your team to understand the why, communicate effectively and clearly with patients about their need and why this matters to them, have a testing protocol, and then be on the same page with managing your metrics and understanding how that integrates with revenue, you are on the path to success, both patient care-wise and financially. You can make a huge difference in your practice, but you gotta start. If you've started and you felt like it was a false start, keep going at it again.
because this journey is worth it. At the end of every conversation that doesn't equate to treatment and next steps for a patient, we still have a hurting person at the end of every one of those. This matters. My Anna matters. Your family member matters. Whoever it is in your life, those people matter. And if we can take what we know and keep moving forward, it's a powerful place to be. You guys can potentially be the hero in somebody's life just by sharing this with them and changing the way that they sleep. So I thank you guys for your time today. Uh, I know we had a couple of questions that I answered going through it. Uh, we are one minute over. So uh, I'm gonna stay on for Q&A. If you guys have any other questions, please feel free to pop them in that section. And I believe Brent's gonna come on here and uh, pop in the link for the CE certificate for you. Yes, thanks, Michael. If everyone uh, looks at the chat section of the, um, your screen there, I just posted the link to the CE. And then if it prompts you for a course code, please use code 200. Um, and if you can't do this at this time, go ahead and take a picture of the screen and you can um, gain access to that uh, CE form at a later time. So cool. All Thank right, you, Let's, we got all the questions answered as we oh. went. Um, oh, it looks like one just came in there. Yep, we got one here. Um, and I, I did also want to say, um, we're going to post our uh, YouTube channel. There's some helpful videos on some of the stuff that we talked about here. Uh, if you guys want to go check those out, we'll throw that in the chat as well. Um, but to answer Melinda's question, uh, where do you get the sleep, uh, the home sleep tests? Uh, Plan Mecca, you can actually get them from Plan Mecca. Uh, we are uh, Awaken to Sleep and Plan Mecca are partnered up uh, for their sleep solution. Um, so they have home sleep testing equipment that you can look at and uh, purchase from them. So I'd encourage you to call your rep and uh, find out what they have to offer. Yep, and if you don't know who your rep is, you can go to our website or phone Plan Mecca at 630-529-2300 or contact your local Plan Mecca authorized dealer in your area and they can get you priced in on that as well. Perfect. All right, cool. wonderful. So thank you, Michael. Um, was there something you were gonna post there or? Um, yes, <laughs> I'm trying. That's fine, take your time. Yeah. Thank you, man. Sorry, guys. Oh, that was about as clunky as a speaker can do it. Oh, perfect. <laughs> there There's you the go. YouTube uh, link. That's perfect. YouTube so everybody channel. can uh, copy that or click on it, and it'll take you to another window uh, where you can view that. So thank you, Michael, for that. So. All right, wonderful. We appreciate everyone's attendance today. Hopefully you'll have a fantastic relaxing weekend and be safe out there. Take care. Thank you guys.